Hey everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen where we are going to make some feta cheese today using raw milk. Now I am admittedly not the best cheese maker in the world. I have made several different varieties of cheese over the years and I would say out of the probably 15 cheeses I've made, only maybe five of them actually turned out. <laughs> so not the best cheese maker in the world, but we do have milk cows here on our property and learning how to make cheese is something that I should probably figure out. Feta cheese is a fairly simple cheese, so I'm going to make that, but I am going to be taking part in a five day cheese making course coming up in June. So hopefully that will improve my cheese making skills. I'm really looking forward to that. The cheese making book I use is Ricky Carroll's Home Cheese Making. I think this is probably an older version. She's probably updated it. When was it? In 2002. So I'm sure she's had another version come out since this one, but there are tons of really great cheese recipes in this one. We are making, like I said, the feta cheese one. So we're going to need one gallon of milk. We're just going to top this one off with a little bit more milk because it's not quite a gallon. There we go. I have a clean pot back there. We're going to make our cheese in. I didn't have a chance to give my kitchen a good clean before you guys joined me today. So I have my big pile of dishes that Dan just washed back over there, some buns here that I am going to be using for dinner tonight. They were made last night, but they were put in a bag when they were still warm. So they were a little bit damp. So I just took them out to air out a little bit before I put them back in the bag again. But I needed to get this cheese going because it is a six hour process to get to the end of it. So I wanted to get it started right now. And then I'll bring you along with the whole entire thing as we go throughout the day. So this um, calls for an ingredient called Le Pace powder, and that will give it a little bit more of that typical feta cheese, that sharp feta cheese kind of flavor. Generally feta is made with goat's milk and I'm making it with cow's milk, the Le Pace gives it that stronger flavor that you're used to, but I have done it without it before and I haven't noticed a huge significant difference. So I'm not gonna be using it today because I don't have any. This is going to go right into our pot over here and we are going to heat our milk to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. This is my cheese spoon that I use for cheese making. So the one thing about milk, and I've talked about this before, is it ha has a really high thermal capacity, meaning it retains heat or it heats up fairly quickly and then it retains that heat for a long time. This is my cheese thermometer that I use. And keep a nice close eye on our temperature here. So we're only going up to 86 and then we're gonna add our culture and 86 is kind of the optimal temperature for being able to develop bacterial, bacterial cultures when you're making cheese or yogurt or anything like that. So we're not that far away. And then we're going to add some mesophilic culture into this, just about there. And we're there, 86. So because my stove is going to retain heat, I want to move it off the element so it doesn't keep heating. We don't want the temperature to get much above 86 or it will kill our culture. So we're gonna add four ounces of our mesophilic culture. So you can buy these cultures lots of different places. Glengarry Cheese Making Company is one that I get them. New England Cheese Making Company, which is a Ricky Carroll's company, is another uh, place that you can get them, but there's lots of other places that you can get them as well. And there is an amazing account on Instagram called Cheese From Scratch. She might be on YouTube as well. Her name's Robin. And she is now making all of her cheese with clabber, uh, which you kind of feed similarly to sourdough on your counter, which is the traditional way of making cheese. So that is also an option as well. And I obviously have zero experience with that, but she would be a great person to follow if you wanna learn more about cheese making. I'm just mixing the culture in with up and down movements here, just around a minute or so. You don't want to agitate the milk too much. And then we're going to let this sit and ripen for an hour before we add our rennet. And I am using rennet 
tablets. You can use liquid rennet, you can use vegetable rennet or animal rennet. There's lots of options. So we're just gonna let this sit now and let all that bacteria start doing its work. So this is the wool that we washed together the other day. It probably has, I'd say, another day before it's fully dry, even maybe by tonight, actually. And so I did do the other brown, the other half of the brown one. This was Hazel's and it is also just about dry. Look at all the hay in there. Oh my gosh. For those of you that missed it, um, I am processing the fleece that we sheared from our sheep last March. And uh, we are actually having the sheep shearer come at the end of this month to do our shearing for this year, but these bags of fleece have been sitting in my shed for the entire year just because I haven't had time to process them, but I really wanted to get them done. So I have one more white one that I need to wash, and then all of these fleece will be done. I have a carding machine that's coming very, very soon. I'm very excited about it. I wasn't going to buy one, but because I am intending on the next steps with this once this is dry is to pick it. And you can use picking machines and I was very tempted to buy one <laughs> because it is quite, quite a thing to just hand pick it all. But if we all pitch in together, it won't take us that long to pick through all of this but I did buy a carding machine. Um, I was talking to one of my neighbors and she has a carding machine and she says, if you're only going to do a couple of fleeces a year, then it's not really worth the money. But I am just this year alone, I'll be doing eight, eight or nine fleeces or something like that. So I definitely wanted to get a machine. So that'll be coming hopefully in the next week or so or so, which is very exciting. So I'll definitely bring you along with me when I open that up and give it its first run through. And then hopefully we can get all of this carded. And then the next step is where I actually get to learn how to spin, which is so incredibly exciting. I cannot wait. I don't know what it is about the feeling of wool for me. I mentioned this, I think in my last video, the smell of it even. A lot of people say that they don't like the smell of it when they're having to wash it and process it, but I actually really like the smell of it. It's a very almost nostalgic smell for me and the feeling and the texture of the wool, I just love so much. I haven't mi minded the process, except it is really hard on my back being bent over and washing it. Actually, you know what? I could use the downstairs sink that's in my laundry room because it's, it's high up. I didn't even think of doing that for it. I have heard of people using a washing machine but I would worry about, so maybe those of you that have experience, if you have used a washing machine, I would be worried about the lanolin and all the dirt kind of gumming up the washing machine itself. We were dumping a lot of the rinse water outside when we were washing these, but yeah, anyways, I'll figure it out as we go, but so far we're loving it. And I will show you this. So this is some of the wool that we've already picked through and is ready for the carding machine. It just feels like a cloud. You just want to crawl in there and cozy up. While this cheese is sitting here, we're going to go down to the grow room because I have some things that I need to do in the grow room with my seedlings and also catch you up on how everything's growing down there. These little guys here, I actually divided these out and put them into their own cells the other day. These are little tiny baby lavender, aren't those little? So I actually wish I had started these back at the beginning or so of January, but I didn't and that's okay. I do have 12 of them. I am going to be growing my lavender in pots in my high tunnel this year. They just never really get going super great here in our climate and I think it just has to do with our cool nighttime temperatures. So I'm going to put them in my high tunnel. I'm gonna do them in pots so that I can hopefully bring them inside and overwinter them. So I'll let you know how that goes when we get to that point. We have some beautiful herbs that I did start early some little sage, that lovely little parsley. So I've already potted these up into larger containers. Some thyme here, looking lovely. I already divided these guys out. They're little strawberries, looking so cute as well. But what I do need to get divided out and put into some larger containers are my little celery. So let me grab those. My germination on my celery was a little bit spotty. That would be a good example. <laughs> Three, four came up in this cell. Maybe I just didn't actually seed these ones and accidentally put all the seeds in one. I don't know. But needless to say, those need to be done. And then of course I also have my celeriac too, which I'll do 
And then something else that I need to do, so these are my snapdragons, and you can see how tall they're getting. They're actually nice and healthy looking. But what I am going to do with these, because I want a nice bushy plant instead of a tall one-stemmed plant, is we are going to snip off right around there. So after the first two sets of true leaves, we're gonna snip that off and then it's going to form branches and it will get bushier. So that's the plan with all of those. I have a whole bunch of snapdragons up over here that I need to do that with. And we have our little baby leeks are starting to come up finally. That took a long time. We have onions coming up all up here. These onions have just started poking through. And check this out. We have some baby tomatoes starting to come up. And our peppers aren't quite yet. I don't expect them to come up for another couple days. I'm so sorry, friends. I just realized that my exhaust fan, I have a fan connected to the space to help to exhaust out some of the humidity. And if the room gets too hot as well, it does the same thing. Um, and it was a little bit loud, so I'm sorry about that. I had a couple of people comment on my last video when I said that I like to keep a fan, especially an oscillating fan. If you have an oscillating one, my oscillating fan broke. So I have just a stationary one right now, but I am going to get one because it's better if the air can be moving over the plants. It's an important thing to have your fan blowing on your plants because it mimics nature it mimics the wind and it helps to strengthen the stems of your plant and a couple of people mentioned that they run their hands over their plants as you were just seeing me do which I do do all the time because I love my plants it's not I don't do it to strengthen their stems but I do it just because I love them so I do think that the theory is kind of the same the only thing that I would say is unless you're doing it very frequently over a 24 hour period, I don't think it's going to have the same impact on your plants as having a fan that is consistently moving the air around your plants. There's also another benefit of having the fan blowing as well though, is it does keep the surface of the soil a little bit drier which inhibits the growth of molds and um, algae. So on the subject of algae, let me see here, because I, I do have some algae I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little bit of green on the surface, uh, surface of my soil. I've never found that to cause any type of issue. The reason that I have algae in mine, let me show you, is because I use one of these sprayers and this just occurred to me the other day that this is the culprit <laughs> for the algae. If you are gonna use a sprayer like this, make sure you clean it frequently and use a little bit of a bleach water solution to kill any algae that's in here. We use spring water and I have not done that with mine and you can see algae on the bottom of my sprayer. So I'm actually inculcating the soil of my seedlings with algae. I'm not worried about it at all. Like I said, I've, I've never noticed it to cause a big, huge issue. And once the plants, because algae really needs light, bright light in order to photosynthesize and grow, is um, once the plants start to get big enough to kind of shade out the soil a little bit, the algae usually goes away. So anyway, I just wanted to touch on that quickly. But now let me show you how I do this with my potting up of these little tiny seedlings. There are some seedlings that you are going to want to be really gentle with. Um, I can think of squash and cucumbers that do not like to be transplanted at all and you want to be really gentle with them. You don't want to start them until about three or four weeks before your last frost and you want to plant them in a big enough container for two reasons. One, because their roots grow incredibly fast and they'll become root bound really fast, but also because you don't want to have to pot them up at all and you want to be able to take them out of whatever container you have and put them right into the soil with disturbing the roots as little as possible. You're not going to probably kill your plant by doing that most of the time unless you really disrupt the roots a lot but you will stunt its growth and when a plant goes into shock it takes a little time to recover so you lose that growing time that your plant should be growing lots of leaves and healthy root systems and that could be a problem if you live in a short growing season like we do so be very gentle and I'll show you once we get to that point in the gardening season where we're doing that I'll show you what I do so I have my little seedlings here and as you can see there's two really close together right here. So I'm just going to very gently tease them apart like so. Like I said, I'm not being super gentle with these little celery seedlings. But once you do do this though, you don't wanna leave them sitting on your workspace like this for very long. You do wanna get them back into soil and then give them a good water right away. 
So I'm just putting these into slightly larger cells. These ones, they'll be able to stay in these until they actually go out into the garden. And if I do notice, I don't generally fertilize my seedlings, but if I do notice that my seedlings are needing a little bit of extra, I will give them a light dose of an organic fertilizer, a liquid fertilizer, and very light dose of it. And also I have done that. I think the only time I've actually ever done that was maybe last year when we had a little bit of unseasonably cold weather where I wasn't able to put my seedlings out and they were definitely struggling a bit. But generally, I do not fertilize my seedlings. I just use a good quality potting soil. You can see me doing here is I am putting a good size hole in here so that these roots that are all hanging down can go right down into that hole, give it a push in and then pack the soil around nice and snug. And sometimes I will top off around the plant with a little bit of extra soil, especially if it's a little bit floppy, just to give it a little support. You do wanna be gentle with the leaves here. I mean, I am picking them up by the leaves, but I'm not squeezing them because I don't wanna damage them. Okay, now we'll give these guys a little water. And voila, let's get these little ones put into larger containers pot these guys up again. So we'll use this size container here. So we're gonna do the same thing, put a nice deep hole in our soil and pop out our little guys. Yeah, you can see the roots are starting to come down the bottom of that container. I actually wanna stick this guy in a little bit deeper. Oh, that looks much happier in there. As is probably obvious, I love gardening so much. I find it really therapeutic and just kind of magical. Look at how beautiful and magical that looks. Dan was actually saying, I don't know if you remember, but he put in a hot water tank that's connected to our wood stove, which is outside of this room. Oh, I need to pressure up my tank here. And um, he had to run water to it, of course. And he said that because it's so close to this room, he can actually run water for me right into this room, which would be amazing. I would love it so much. I do have a sink that's in the laundry room that's just down that hallway. I would love to not have to haul water back and forth. That would be just amazing. Don't be shy with water when you are transplanting. It does help with the transplant shock if they're well watered. So I'm just gonna finish up here with my celery. Oh, these ones need to be packed down a little more. And then uh, we'll go back upstairs and finish up our cheese. All right, it has been sitting. I was just thinking about my cheese making history and why I think it is that I've just never been a really good cheese maker and I honestly think it's an attention span issue. So I'm just gently stirring the curds and I'm going to do this for 20 minutes. So anyway, I have to stand here and stir this cheese pot for 20 minutes. <laughs> this is kind of leads into what I was saying. So I think that the reason that I am not a very good cheese maker has to do with attention span and desire to want to sit over a pot like this and stir this for 20 minutes. And this is an easy cheese to do in comparison to some of the other cheeses that require a lot more attention and a lot more time in the kitchen. And I know lots of other really amazing cheese makers, two off the top of my head, Kate from Venison for Dinner and uh, Robin from Cheese from Scratch, who I mentioned earlier, who both have really busy lives too and somehow they have been able to incorporate cheese making into their daily life. So maybe I'm doing it wrong. I don't know, but I just like the thought of sitting here and stirring this for 20 minutes makes me feel like I'm gonna go a little bit bananas. So, and then doing that regularly, doing this more than just once in a while. 
Oh, I don't think so. Boring. <laughs> so I guess I could put on a podcast or something like that. And I know like cheese making is definitely an art form. There's no question about it. And I'm sure like anything, if you get really good at it and you love it, then you don't mind doing this. But yeah, that's not me. So cheese, I can't see myself ever really being a a really excellent cheesemaker or somebody who cheese makes all the time. But I do think that for a cheese like feta, that is so easy to make. And even uh, like a 30 minute mozzarella is easy to make. I think that it's probably a good idea since I do have milk cows. I uh, make yogurt all the time and I make cork all the time. Cork is a like a soft kind of yogurt style cheese. And I love uh, both of those, but they are very easy to do and they don't require a lot of babysitting. But it does make sense to make cheese. So what's happening with this stirring process, let me show you, is that I am stirring more of the way out of these curds. And that's what we want. I suppose I really don't need to sit here and stir it straight for 20 minutes. I could probably stir, give it a few minutes and stir again. The instructions do say to stir it gently for 20 minutes. But anyways, that's what we're doing. We're taking the extra whey out of here and then we're gonna strain this and the whey is going to go out to my chickens. It's very high in calcium, so it's good for nice hard shells, but also uh, the chickens love it. Then, uh, like I said, we'll hang it with cheesecloth, in cheesecloth for six hours. And then we're going to cut it into some one inch slices and put it into the fridge, let it age for a few days, and then we're going to be able to use it. something fun to show you. So you remember the SCOBY that I was showing you how you can grow from a store-bought raw kombucha? Well, we are now, I think on around day seven, and we have a gorgeous SCOBY. Can you see that? So that's what a SCOBY is. So what a SCOBY is, is it sounds kind of gross, and I guess it is kind of gross, and it also looks a little bit gross. I think this one is particularly beautiful, but it is a symbiotic culture of bacterias and yeast, and what it does is it ferments the tea. We make a sweet tea, which I have already made over here, and it ferments that sweet tea and makes it into a effervescent, like a fizzy drink, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So I didn't have a SCOBY. Uh, my last SCOBY, I can't remember when that was. I don't know, sometime during the summer anyways, I just decided I didn't wanna make kombucha for a while and I knew I could make my own SCOBY when I needed one again. Dan has been drinking kombucha again, so I decided I would start up a batch of kombucha. I experimented with starting my own SCOBY using store-bought kombucha about a year or so ago, maybe two years ago now, and it worked really well. I just kind of came up with a, a method on my own. So all I did to do this, if you missed it, it's really easy, is I just filled a quart jar halfway with boiling water, added two tea bags and a half a cup of sugar, stirred that up, let it dissolve, let it come down to room temperature because you don't wanna add raw kombucha in to it because it would kill all the bacteria. And then I topped it off with the raw kombucha and I used the GT's brand of pure raw kombucha but I don't think the brand would make a difference as long as it's raw, that part's really important because you need all that live, those live bacteria in there. Covered it with a cloth and a band and I put it in a warm spot. Having it be in a warm spot is important because it will take a long time for those bacteria to get going if it's not a warm spot. So I actually just put it down in my living room by a heat vent, kind of pushed against the wall because it was the warmest place in my house. Putting it in front of a wood stove or anything like that would be far too warm. So we want to work up to a one gallon. So generally people will make their uh, kombucha in a one gallon jar using one cup of sugar and I 
think it's six tea bags, pretty sure it's six tea bags. I'd have to double check that. What we're gonna do now is work up to that so that we have a really strong, nice, big SCOBY. So we're going to get a half gallon jar. I've just made some sweet tea here. Well, I did it quite a while ago, um, just so that it would be cooled off. And I'm going to pull my tea bags out. So all we're gonna do is dump this right into our jar. And we want all that stuff on the bottom. So there, there'll be some solid stuff on the bottom there. And you can see our SCOBY is rising back up to the top. And what it will do is it will come flat on the top and then it will start forming a SCOBY the size of this. So we're going to use our cloth cover again. You do wanna make sure that there's some airflow and oxygen in there for your bacteria. We're going to lid it up and set it back in a nice warm place out of direct sunlight. So I'm going to give this another seven days and then we'll be doing the same thing again except with a gallon jar. We just wanna use black tea, by the way, if I didn't mention that. Six uh, tea bags, one cup of sugar, and then I'm going to dump that entire jar that I have going over there into that. We'll bring it up to a gallon and then we'll leave it again for another week and we should have drinkable kombucha at that point. I do have a two gallon kombucha jar that I use that has a spigot on the bottom and I make a never ending kombucha. Well, it does end when you decide you're not gonna feed it anymore, but it is one that I just keep adding to so that we always have every couple of days a fresh batch of kombucha. But when we get to that point, I'll show you that whole process. Good morning, friends. How are you? It is six o'clock in the morning and I didn't get to this cheese last night. So, and which is fine. It's not a big deal if it hangs a little bit extra time. So now we are going to slice it into cubes and then put it in the fridge to sit in the fridge for four or five days with some salt. So that's what it looks like when it comes out of the bag. And you can use do this in a salt brine too, but I'm just gonna sprinkle salt on them. So there we go. Feta cheese. This is going to sit in the fridge for four to five days, and then at that point, we're gonna eat it right away. But if I was going to leave it in the fridge for longer than that, you can, um, for up to 30 days, I would make a brine for it with salt and water quite a bit of salt, and a little bit of calcium chloride is what the recipe calls for, just if you want the flavor to be a little bit stronger, because like I said, with the cow's milk, the flavor is not quite as strong as you would be used to um, from a regular goat feta that you would got, buy from the grocery store, but I've always really enjoyed feta made with cow's milk. So that is going to be it for today's video, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye!